everybody talks about women in academia and women in academia, but do we really know what that means? Do we know the real human cost of being a woman in academia? Yeah. The most successful that I know, that I admire in my field, are either not married and not partnered, or they don't have children. What does that say then to me, who already has children? It says, you ain't going to make it. I moved to Cambridge in 2016 with my two children, uh, who were at the time age eight months old and three and a half year old. And I was hoping that I could actually study and raise a family as a single parent at the university here. Um, it has been since really, really challenging, but also uh, possible. So there's trade-offs, there's things I have to give up. Uh, there is a lot of angst um, on the part of my children because they don't get to see me as much as they would. I rely so much on external help. I rely on my friends. I rely on childcare providers to do the tough bits of raising children. Cambridge itself, the university, is very, very difficult to navigate. I didn't understand even when I was applying that there is a different system when you're a family and you're applying to Cambridge that you have to know that some colleges have structures that support families and other colleges don't. Uh, I was interested in um, a women-only college because I felt like my feminist um, views and perspectives and stand were better off in that environment which was really wonderful but at the same time my college did not have that structure in place that really supports people with families and so all of this was very very confusing I hadn't realized just how expensive childcare is in Cambridge it's going to be about a thousand and one hundred or so pounds per month if I had not found a scholarship that provides help for families, I would not have come to Cambridge. The way that the academia is structured today, there is no space for any of these other things which they call distractions. You know, you're supposed to be this imaginary uh, Darwin, Einstein person who sits in the high tower and thinks about the world and writes about the world and then discovers things about phenomena uh, around the world. You're not supposed to be raising children and running after childcare, this and that, because that's kind of distracted from the big intellectual project of, you know, of humanity. And that way of seeing things really basically keeps the rest of us out of it. Now, when I was coming to Cambridge. I really, really wanted to be part of that intellectual project. But as I come to the end of it, I know I can't for logistical reasons and, you know, fairly just practical reasons. And because I, I, I don't think that the institutions that I am interested in are able to accommodate the kinds of uh, circumstances that are associated with being inclusive. Even though I really believe that the university has invested so much in my work and my contribution and that I still have the intellectual capacity to help. But, but I can't because it requires to have a family trust, which I don't have. There is one woman uh, who's black here at the University of Cambridge, who, is, who has the title of professor. This is a university that employs hundreds of people, hundreds, and yet there is only one. There's only one black woman who runs a college and she was appointed not more than a year ago. All of these things do not inspire confidence that academia is open to people like me. And so when I think of what the price to pay then, the price I had to pay to be a student, to add that to another even harder, bigger, more costly price to pay to be in academia, I think, is it worth it really? And that's the question I haven't quite 
found an answer for. But as things are now, I, I don't know if I could put my family through yet another demanding but not certain promise of a better life. I love, you know, I love what I do and I do want to participate in that stuff and it's great, but it also comes with that kind of, it's always that cost, isn't it? It's always like a cost-benefit analysis, isn't it? Like what you're doing and what's worth spending your time on and what's, what's practical as well. I always feel it constantly feels like everyone's doing me a favour all the time. I mean, you know, I constantly have to ask permission to do my work, which is one of the big, I think, points of tension that we feel between, between my husband and I in terms of how we conceive of what we're doing is that his work is obviously, there's no, there's no question about it. Whereas my work is much more, it's difficult what you call, you know, it's not so clear cut about what's work and, and what's not. And I think also the problem is, is it's also that it's infinite. Like the amount of work you could do is, there's no end to it. And so it's very difficult, I think for me, in terms of being able to have that feeling of sometimes like, completion or you, you know in terms of feeling at the end of the week that's okay you've done enough work you can never do enough as a mother and you can never do enough on your PhD and also no one very rarely does anyone tell you you're doing a good job of either of them and I think that's one of the things I find really hard I get so jealous of like undergraduates and some postgraduates who live in college because they literally can get three meals a day cooked for them. And then when I heard what a bedder was, is it called a bedder? Someone told me, I think it's, someone told me what a bedder was, but literally someone who doesn't just like take your bins out, they literally tidy your room for you. Could you imagine? I think that I've always quite liked my supervisor that she's very open and honest about the fact that she's got a family and her family are important to her. Because that's how I feel, that I don't want to, I don't want to have to completely distance myself from these two things. That I definitely think that it's it's a very important part of me that I've got a child. And I don't think I don't think I don't I don't I, I feel it's a really bad situation people feel they've got to hide that and that, that means you can't be a credible, you know, can't have an idea of a credible academic career or be a good PhD student if you've got a baby. I just think it'd be so good, especially when they're really little, you know, if you still need to physically be with them. Like, I always just think it'd be so great just to have someone you could just do like two hours work and someone would just hold your baby for you. You need to see children here. I don't know what would be, I don't know where I could take, you know, if I had another child and I wanted to go to supervisions or I wanted to come pick up books, like, can I, could, I, could I bring them in? And like, is there any way you could feed them? All these kind of questions that I just have absolutely no point of reference for because I've never seen anyone else do any of these things or heard about anyone doing these things. I read it in the library newsletter that now um, children are allowed in the library. It's a really nice gesture that I would have definitely have liked when, when I was myself a student with my little baby and not daring entering the library and delegating friends and husband to go and fetch books for me. When I had my first baby, I thought, oh, that's fine, I'm going to be able to read tons of books and, um, you know, continue writing my chapters with a cup of tea at the table and the baby will be gently sleeping in his cot. Um, I definitely had no idea what it meant to have a baby. He turned out to be a koala, koala baby, so to speak, so one of those babies that don't want to be put down or who only do naps for a very short period of time. He was a serial cat napper. So I wasn't able to do anything without being interrupted. As a student, I encountered a lot of support from many people around the university, my friends, my supervisor, my tutor at the college. Uh, still, it felt a bit like uncharted territory, so to speak. And I was really struggling because my son was just starting nursery and as many mothers know, that's when they usually catch lots of germs and are ill very often. It was about every 10 days for my son, so I would have to stay home for a few days. Um, 
for him to recover and that was really often it would interrupt my work a lot so I would feel very guilty about not working um, even if being a student, a PhD student, is sometimes quite flexible, especially in the humanities. Um, I would have anxieties about catching up work during weekends, during evenings, during nights. And when I was with my son, I was thinking about work. And was I, when I was at work and putting him back to nursery, when he still had a runny nose and a bit of a fever, um, I would feel very guilty not being with him. So it was really something that, um, that made my postpartum depression worse. I think in the end, after a while, I decided to really cut work and personal life. And I adopted office hours for working on my thesis. I would never work beyond nursery hours after, after I had this big down moment. So it's just getting light here in Cambridge this morning as I'm on my way to the Judge Business School. Um, about to sit an accountancy exam. I'm feeling really sleep deprived thanks to my little daughter and her teasing problems um, or whatever's going on. I need to get up at about 5.30 in order to both feed Chloe and get ready and travel into the city centre in order to sit this exam. The, the course has got really long days, so starting maybe half eight, nine in the morning and a lot of evenings there's a college dinner as well. The thing that I found most challenging, like logistically, was the fact that I didn't really have anywhere to express breast milk and to store breast milk whilst I was in the judge. So that meant I was getting very uncomfortable and I was often having to go into like a seminar room or, you know, a, a, te a side teaching room that's not being used. I could really do with somewhere quiet and um, private where I could express breast milk and a little fridge where I could store it so I didn't have to constantly carry around my little cool bag with ice packs and breast milk uh, when I'm doing long days at the, at the Judge Business School. The other thing that's a little bit of a challenge is I don't have anywhere to change baby's nappy or, or my husband as well because it's not just me changing her nappy. I had to ask for everything that I needed for my daughter, which meant as a mother, I didn't actually feel hugely included. I think inclusion is about making preparations for people so that they don't always have to ask for something. And for you to feel included, you need to have the facilities that you need without constantly having to make a fuss and ask for them. It's, it's already questioned your identity. You already feel different to your pre-child self. And so any little thing that can be done to just normalize motherhood, to make it a, a, an everyday occurrence for a woman to be breastfeeding her child in the business school, or for a, a father to be changing the nappy of his child in the business school, anything like that makes you just feel included. It makes you feel, yeah, normal. <laughs> Well, I love my job. I, mean, I, I consider my job at Cambridge the best job uh, that I ever had in my life. I'm really inspired every day here at the university. I met amazing people that I'm developing projects with. Uh, I'm having full freedom, while at the same time a range of resources uh, to use for my, for my research. So I really, really love it. And at the same time, if I were economically rational, I would immediately give it up because uh, for, for, for a long time, I've been losing money every month. This position was invented at the times where a typical acad academic was a single male. The college is literally your, your parent that feeds you, cleans after you and, and takes this holistic care of you. And that model does not work when you're a parent. First, because you're not allowed to live in the college, so you don't get free accommodation that the, that the single fellow gets. Second, of course, you're not going to eat all your meals at the college because you have family, so you share some of the meals with your family. And third and most important, uh, if you want to have some work done, you need childcare. And childcare in Cambridge is hugely expensive. And in principle, these positions do not foresee this kind of expenses. So all of a sudden, 
if you're a junior research fellow while being a mother, then you realize that your salary doesn't basically cover the Cambridge rent and Cambridge childcare fee combined. So King's College was unique in a way that it actually had a childcare support policy. So while the original intention of the old policy was to cover up to 70% of a childcare fee, at the moment where I started working at the college, it was covering 12, maybe 15% of childcare fee. The, the unique thing about the colleges is that uh, they operate like little democracies. Our fellows are trustees and we can make political reforms within the college. And we sat together, we discussed it, uh, we collected data, we drafted a policy paper. I was surprised how many of them actually supported it, both men and women. And still, to our surprise, the thing got stuck. It's a way of skillful avoidance, of course, that is not necessarily even fueled by maliciousness, but but more by the avoidance, because uh, such policy means you have to find money for it, and it's a difficult matter, so it's just easier for everyone not to deal with it. We realized that the only way to, to have it unstuck would be to increase the urgency, to raise the temperature, to, to make other people feel the discomfort that is caused um, by the, the, state, the current state of affairs for, for young parents. Well, I have more, what you can say, heartfelt conversations with uh, people who make those decisions, with the provost, with vice provost, with the bursar of the college not even to ask them for anything and uh, definitely not to criticize them but just more to let them know how does it work or doesn't work for me and just to tell them yeah how i love this job and how this job is unlivable for me in many ways and uh, how difficult it is and they were shocked because most of them honestly didn't know so now the, the, the policy differentiate and especially for young academics of low income, it, um, it covers more like 65% of the monthly childcare fee. And it's going to start operating as of October 2020, so very soon. I tell my students not to give up. Within what's possible, within the power that you're given, sometimes even by virtue of just being there, physically being there, you can still at least make them notice something.